you know, I like to start with something a little light. So I went back into the archives, okay? And I was looking at some church bulletin or church program bloopers. You know how they have n announcements in the, in the uh, programs. In the, well, here's a few that were bloopers. Bertha Belch, a missionary from Africa, will be speaking tonight at Calvary Methodist. Come here, Bertha Belch, all the way from Nigeria. <laughs> a fasting and conference, a fasting and prayer conference is next Saturday. It's free and includes meals. <laughs> the sermon this morning, Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight. Searching for Jesus. <laughs> the, peace the peacemaking meeting scheduled for today has been canceled due to a conflict. <laughs> Remember in prayer the, <laughs> the many who are sick of our community. <laughs> I think they meant in our community. Uh, for those of you who have children and don't know it, we have a nursery downstairs. <sighs> At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to the choir practice. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, none of us are perfect, right? And if you've read any of my emails, you know that I frequently have typos. Hopefully not that drastic, but maybe so. <laughs> maybe so. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, we love you, our mighty, holy God. We thank you for this time together, that we may worship you, that we may um, just be in awe of your word and your goodness and your glory. Speak to us now through your Holy Spirit and through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're rolling into Psalm 109. We're in the fifth book of the Psalms that that's divided into five books that kind of line up with the five books of Moses. And as we're looking at this one today, it's called The Song of the Slandered. It's written by David, and it is an imprecatory psalm. And remember, those are the ones I like to refer to as the God, go get them psalms. Because he, David is praying. He had a lot of enemies, and he asks God to take care of his enemies. And so, with that, um, he begins in the first five verses. Uh, he's asking God to judge his enemies in this, but he first says, here's the problem. Here's what they have done. Verse 1. Be not silent, O God, of my praise, for the wicked and deceitful mouths are opened against me, speaking against me uh, with lying tongues. They encircle me with words of hate and attack me without cause. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. So they reward me evil for good and hatred for my love. And so now he's, he comes up with the solution for God, okay? This is what he wants God to do. Verse 6, appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Whoa! I mean, we're getting stronger and stronger, David. Who is this? Is this Saul or is this Absalom or is it one of the Philistines? Who is it you are so upset with? And he continues, May his children wander about and beg, seeking food 
far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor pity to his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. Okay, this is thought to be and considered to be the strongest of all the imprecatory psalms, and I don't think we have much of an argument about that. But uh, in this, as David is calling down the curses on, on his enemies, it's an important to remember that these prayers, in them, he does not take action against his enemies, even when he had the opportunity to slay Saul, who was trying to kill him, he didn't. When his son Absalom was trying to kill him, he told his armies, don't harm my son Absalom. He was harmed anyway, he was killed, but that was not his doing. David's intent was always for vengeance to be the Lord's, which is taught throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. As we look at this, we see that Jesus Christ wasn't quite this strong against his enemies, was he? From the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So he offered forgiveness even in the midst of being unjustly arrested and executed. But he had also taught this earlier in Luke 6, 27, and this is also in Matthew 5 and other places. But to you who are listening, I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. So that is Jesus' message to us. Yeah, the Psalms are honest, and we can be honest with God, too. We can say, Lord, they've hurt me. I hope you're going to take care of my enemies. I don't think we need to get quite as graphic as David did in some of these. But, but then we need to love them and pray for them. Romans 12, 14 through 19 says this, and this is Paul writing. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So in this time when there are so many divisions in our world, in our nation, um, it's good to remember that we need as much as it is in our, as it depends on us to live peaceably and to pray for those that we disagree with. And, and so it's still a message for us today. Then, um, as with most of the Psalms, it ends uh, on a more of an up note. Verse 26, Help me, O Lord my God. Save me according to your steadfast love. Let them know that this is your hand, that this is your hand, you, O Lord, have done it. Verse 30, With my mouth I will give great thanks to the Lord. I will praise him in the midst of the throng. Now, last week we talked about thanksgiving a lot. In fact, the majority of the psalms we looked at last week were psalms of thanksgiving. And I told you about an article from the Christian Post that t taught how uh, gratitude helps rewire our brains and how it is good for us emotionally, spiritually, physically to be grateful and I encouraged you all to start a gratitude journal beginning on Easter 40 days of gratitude and write down something or five somethings every day that you are grateful for well I noticed yesterday that Lauren uh, our coordinator here had posted this on her Facebook page and you see her Bible is open, her journal is open, she's listing it, and, uh, I, you know, 
you can't really read what her journal says, but I'm sure my name is on it a few times. <laughs> I can't quite make it out. <laughs> but I would love to see those of you who are doing this, and listen, if you forgot Easter, you can start today. You can start today doing 40 Days of Gratitude. I would love for you to post a picture similar, different, of what you're grateful for, or a verse of thanksgiving, and uh, share it with me, and we can put it on our Facebook page. Because I would love, in this, in this time when people are more into criticizing and complaining, I would love for us to have gratitude that we're putting out there, love and gratitude. So I challenge you to do that. Um, Let's look at Psalm 110, and we're going to park on this one a while. The coming of the priest, judge, king. This is authored by David, and it is a royal psalm and a messianic psalm, meaning it's pointing ahead to the Messiah. Um, <clears throat> the, the first three verses are going to portray the Messiah as king. Verse 4 is going to portray the Messiah as priest, and then 5 through 7 as the victorious warrior. Now, this short psalm, only seven verses, is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. It is quoted or referred to 27 times. So what does that tell you? It was important to the New Testament writers, and therefore it's also... Old Testament, New Testament, important to us. Uh, so let's look at this. Um, the, the first verse is the most quoted, and then the second most quoted is, is going to be verse 4. But um, as we're all, they're both pretty close. Okay, so like many of the other psalms, this one is called the Psalm of David. And perhaps nowhere is David's authorship more critical, more important than in this psalm. And uh, in it, we're going to see that he is praying to the Lord about his Lord. And some of this is a little confusing. It even confused the Pharisees. So let's jump in and look at verse 1, and we're going to have it on the screen. The Lord, and when it's all caps... In the Old Testament, what does that mean? It's referring to Yahweh, that personal name, that covenant name of God. Okay, the Lord, Yahweh, says to my Lord, lowercase. So, Lord, all caps, is all through the Old Testament. Uh, God is all through the Old Testament, but Lord is used fewer times. And when it's written L, lowercase, O-R-D, that's the Hebrew word, Adonai, which means like master, Lord, the one in charge. But it's, it's a term for the Lord as well. But it says, okay, so Yahweh says to Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. In this psalm, it is like uh, David is overhearing a conversation between God the Father and Jesus the Messiah. And he's saying, just sit here at the right hand till I make all your enemies your footstool. Why is he saying this? Well, it's important enough that this one verse is quoted 17 times in the New Testament. And basically, um, we know that it's referring to Jesus. But you might say, how, how do you know that? How do you get that, Yahweh and Adonai, God, I get, but how do you know that that Adonai word is referring to Jesus? Well, in Peter's great sermon that he gives on Pentecost Day, the birthday of the church, Acts chapter 2, he says this, beginning in verse 32 of Acts 2, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Therefore, be, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, 
But he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So they're saying David didn't ascend, so he couldn't be at the right hand of God right now. Verse 36, let all the house of Israel know, therefore, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you have crucified. And remember, Christ is the New Testament Greek word that means the same thing as Messiah, which is the Old Testament Hebrew word. So he's saying, no, for certain, God made him both Lord. Lord and Christ. So that makes it pretty clear that God was talking, the psalm is talking about Jesus, right? Well, what does Jesus have to say about it? Well, you know, the Pharisees like to gather around Jesus when he was teaching and start asking him questions, quizzing him, and many times Jesus would turn it back around and start asking them questions. Matthew twenty two forty one says, now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ, the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. And he said, then, said to them, How is it then that David, in the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies under your feet. So he's saying, it, it tells us a couple of things. When David wrote that, he was in the Spirit, means he was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote the Psalms, okay? But what his, his quiz them, what does that mean? If he's the son, how does that work? And he said, verse 45, if then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day forward did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, well, he stumped us with that. Yeah. Uh, so Jesus was trying to make these religious leaders see that... Um, the son of David, the son of David was not only human, but God. He was both. And uh, so he was, yeah, the human descendant of David, that's correct. But he is also the spiritual divine Lord. And so we see that um, this is not the only place. There are other places that talk about this, but I want to first look, because some of you may be wondering, how could Jesus have existed back there during David's time and still be his son, because that Jesus doesn't even show up till Bethlehem, Luke 2. How could he? Well, as I've mentioned in here many times, but we've got a lot of new people, uh, Jesus was around from before the beginning. Okay, he is everlasting, past and present. And what the three most critical places that we see that in the New Testament are John 1, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 1 that says in verse 1, Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our, to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So, so that tells us Jesus was there. He was, create, he was the creator. And he is now at the right hand of the Son of God. And so the book of Hebrews is often referred to as the book of better things. And in it we see that he begins by saying, after he introduces Jesus in this way, he says... 
Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the prophets. He's even better than the angels. And in Hebrews 1.13, he says this, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? So the writer of Hebrews is also quoting Psalm 110. And then in Hebrews 10.11 he says, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So we see, and we're not going to look at all 17 times it's quoted, but you can see the importance of this verse. Then in verse 2 of 110, it says, The Lord, Yahweh, sends forth from Zion, that's another name for Jerusalem, the holy city, sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power, in holy garments, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. So when the Messiah returns, he will rule from Zion, from Jerusalem, the holy city. He will rule from there on the throne of David. And he says, and, and to him, his holy, uh, re, his redeemed people, that would be us, who have put our faith and trust in Jesus as our Savior, will be coming, will join him in holy garments. Holy garments. You're going to get some new holy garments. Revelation talks about it too. And the way it's described, it is going to be the greatest linen you've ever worn because it's going to be wrinkle-free. Okay, maybe it didn't say that part. But it's going to be holy, like priests are required to wear, it, it, the Jewish priests to wear linen. It is going to be like awesome, our holy garments. Verse 4. The Lord has sworn, and he will not change his mind. Jesus, God, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. His word doesn't change. His promises are true. So he says, the Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. And then it has this quote. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So God swore it. It's going to happen. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the king. And he is a priest of the order of Melchizedek. Now, so in this we see that there's another order of priests because Melchizedek preceded... Levi, the tribe of, Le of the Levites, the, which was the priestly tribe. Uh, and then from that tribe, the descendants of Aaron are the only ones who could be priests. Well, some of you are going, who is Melchizedek? And why does he have such a funny sounding name? Well, let's look at him and his name because he first appears in Genesis chapter 14. And what has happened here is that Abraham and Lot have parted ways because they had so much uh, cattle that they needed to separate. And so Lot goes one way, Abraham goes another, and then after a while Lot gets in trouble and he has all these kings come up against him. Well, Abraham gathers his army together, which was his filled hands, and they go and they fight off the enemies of, of uh, Lot and conquer them. And after they do, he shows up, Abraham does, to this guy, Melchizedek. Verse uh, 18 in Genesis 14 says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. 
Okay, so Melchizedek is kind of this mysterious character. In fact, he is so mysterious that people have looked further and further into him, and he's, he's mentioned here in Genesis, in Psalms, and then in four chapters of Hebrews. Some would say he is just a mysterious figure who foreshadows Jesus Christ. Others would say he is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, meaning before Jesus came as flesh and blood, he had several appearances. This would have been one. Let's look and see more about him, and you can see what you think. Okay. Um, Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness. Anytime you see Zedek at the end of a Hebrew name, that's king. And so his name means king of righteousness. In the, this passage he, in Genesis, he's also called the king of Salem. Salem was the name of Jerusalem early on. Uh, Salem is the same as Shalom, which means peace. So he is the king of righteousness. He is the king of peace. Let's look a little further. Uh, he brings um, bread and wine. That, especially this time of year, right after Easter, kind of the bread and wine, what does that make you think of? Last Supper? Uh, he's called a priest of God Most High, El Elyon in Hebrew. And Jesus, we know it was prophet, priest, and king from looking at prophecies and fulfillments in the New Testament. So here, Melchizedek blesses Abraham. Um, he declares in this the true nature of Abram's victory, and it wasn't that he had such a powerful army, it's that God did it. It says, God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So he's, he's letting... Uh, Abe know where his power came from. It was from God. He, um, Abraham gives him a tithe. This is first mention of tithe, and that's what tenth means in the Bible. And so he is giving a tithe to this priest, Melchizedek. Um, and then we see that, uh, you know, again, as we look at Psalm 110, you are a priest forever, forever, not temporarily, not just till you die, forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, um, this verse is quoted by Jesus in Mark 12, 36. Um, it's quoted, like I said, for, in four different chapters, multiple times within each chapter in Hebrews. Uh, and let's look at a few of those. Okay, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6 says, As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 10 says, Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Um, Hebrews 6, 20 says, Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner, on our behalf, having become a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So that's what Jesus is. He, he is the fulfillment of that. Hebrews 7, 1 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, just what we've said, king of righteousness. Then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of priests. Then it gives a description here that we don't get in Genesis or in Psalms. It says, he is without father, or mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God as he continues a priest forever. 
Okay, so he has no beginning or end. He has no genealogy. He's always been. That's why some people say it's pre-incarnate Christ. Is it symbolically saying that and he's a foreshadowing? Or is he literally Christ who was at that point? But it says um, at the end he resembles the Son of God and continues as a priest forever. So we know that Jesus does continue as a priest forever and a king forever. He was prophet, priest, and king. He won't need to prophesy forever. But he will be king and, and priest forever. So uh, let's review this. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. He was the king of Salem, which means king of peace. He is the priest of the God Most High forever. He had no genealogy, no beginning or end. He brings bread and wine. Uh, and Hebrews never says that Jesus was better than Melchizedek. Yeah, he, Hebrews says he's better than Moses, he's better than the prophets, he's better than the angels. He, he says that uh, he's better than the temple. That Jesus is get to, gone to a better land and his covenant is a better covenant. But nowhere does it say Jesus is better than Melchizedek. That doesn't mean that he's not, but could it mean that he is one and the same? Things to ponder things to research on your own. I would encourage you to read Hebrews chapters 5 through 10, which talks so much about Jesus with many references to Melchizedek. Back to Psalm 110. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So Christ is going to fulfill all this at his return at Armageddon. He will, uh, he will, there will be a battle. He will be victorious. And it says that the Messiah will be refreshed and lift up his head. He will be victorious. Powerful psalm. We're going to, we spent a lot of time on that, so we're going to go pretty quickly over the next few, and then we're going to park on another one. Psalm 111, praise for God's tender care. This is an anonymous psalm of thanksgiving. This is also an acrostic psalm. Uh, there's a few of those, uh, but this one is arranged, uh, all of them are arranged according to the Hebrew alphabet, which had, the ancient alphabet had 22 letters, so each line of it uh, started with, you know, like the first aleph, and it goes through the last letter, ta, of the Hebrew alphabet. And, and so it, it takes more skill, in a sense, to, to write poetry and music in this way, more thoughts, more... Uh, but, so what's the purpose of it? Is it just to make it a little more difficult to write? Is it to make it a little more beautiful? Or is it to help people learn? And you know, all of this is about memorization because they didn't have, in book five, it's not everybody, it wasn't like turn in your hymn book to Psalm 111. They had to memorize this. Yeah, there, there were the leaders who could read and had access to the scrolls, but the people had to memorize this. So when they put these acrostic ones out, it really helped with memorization. And um, so anyway, let's look at the first few verses. Praise the Lord. Okay, in Hebrew, that's hallelujah. We were singing a lot of hallelujah this morning. Halal is praise when you see that halalu is praise, Yah, at the end of the word, that means Yahweh is somewhere in that word. So this one, hallelujah means praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. That's you guys. What are you doing on a Wednesday morning when you could be, some of you at work and you've, you're take, you take an early lunch hour, some of you could be uh, doing a thousand different things because everybody in here is busy in one sense or another. But you obviously delight in the word of the, God, of the Lord because you are here to study his word today. 
And I commend you for that. So he's saying, the great of the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has called us his gracious works to be remembered. And that's why we're here too. We don't just want to just study it and forget it, right? We want to remember this stuff. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. And then it talks about how uh, he, he gives them the inheritance of the nation. The works of his hand are faithful and just. His pre precepts are trustworthy. Uh, they're established forever and ever. They're performed in faithfulness and righteousness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. And then it says in verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise continues forever. So, recognizing the greatness of God's works, one should appropriately fear God. God should be regarded with respect, with reverence, with awe, and at times with trembling fear. And that's all just our starting point. The beginning of wisdom starts with that reverence, and fear of the Lord. And so once we get that established, then we get it and have the proper attitude toward God, our Creator and Savior, then we can really, the studying really takes hold. And we can grow in that and become wise. Now, many commentators uh, note that there's a connection between Psalm 10, well, I mean 111 and 112. They are both acrostic poems, but 111 focuses on God, and 112 focuses on godly people. So the, uh, in 112, it's called The Blessings of Those Who Fear God. The author is anonymous, and it's a psalm of praise. Uh, the first nine verses uh, are talks about the blessings of the righteous. It begins, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their, riches, and their righteousness endures forever. It goes on to say that they're going to be generous. They're going to lend freely. They're going to be just. They're not going to be shaken. They'll be remembered. They have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Uh, their hearts are secure. They'll look in triumph at their foes, and they will, again, freely scatter their gifts to, their, to the poor, and their horn will be high and lifted up. So we look at this, and I want you to understand this is true, but it's a general principle. Not everyone who is righteous, because you may be going, man, I think I've tried, I, I'm a believer, I've tried to live as close to God's promises as I can, but my house is not overflowing with wealth and riches, and I don't feel like I've been blessed in all these ways. Um, know this first of all, okay, a general principle, but God does bless. And the wealth and the riches that he gives us are not always those that we're going to have in our bank account. In fact, the most important, the best wealth and riches we will receive are not material riches. So, so don't get all caught up in, uh, well, I'm going to name it and claim it. God, you said I'm going to have wealth and riches in my house. I claim that now, and I want it now, because you promised it to me. These are general prim promises, and they're not all material. So don't get wrapped up in materialism. That gets you on the wrong track. Then this last verse is about the judgment of the wicked. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. 
And we've seen in some of the other psalms that the psalmist is going, why are the wicked prospering and not the poor who are righteous? And, and so what he's saying here is, yeah, their day's coming. Their day's coming. Our day is coming. It is glorious. It is in heaven. The streets are gold. It's a, it, the food is great. And there's no more pain or sorrow or mourning. That's what we have to look forward to. But the wicked, it says they, they will come to nothing. They're going to be gnashing their teeth, uh, vexed. So, so we see that division there. Now these next psalms, Psalm 113 through 118, are called the Hallel. Hallel psalms. Hallel means praise. But these are called the Egyptian Hallel. There's three different sets of Hallel psalms. So these Egyptian ones refer back to the Exodus, the time when the nation of Israel wasn't even a nation yet. They were just a people living in bondage in Egypt. And so these psalms recall their deliverance, and um, they are sung for Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Psalm 113, let's start there. The condescending grace of God. It's anonymous. It's a psalm of praise. And it is a very majestic psalm of praise that begins, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting. His glory above the heavens. Uh, And, you know, we hear a lot of this in our songs, don't we? Yeah. The Lord is high above the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit as princes and with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home and makes her the joyous mother of children. Hallelujah. Psalm 114 continues the Hallel. Praise for the Exodus, another anonymous psalm of praise. Uh, It's going to expound on the mighty deeds of the Exodus, Israel's deliverance, uh, which that is the central act of redemption in the entire Old Testament is God redeeming his people, delivering them out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, and then bringing them, you know, uh, into the land, uh, the promised land. Verse 1, when Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob, and the house of Jacob is Israel. Remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So part of the time he's referred to, or the nation is referred to as Israel, and part of the time is Jacob. Same, Same people, okay? The house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary. Now Judah is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. So he had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. I'm not going to name all of them, but Judah, the fourth son, uh, becomes the, the royal tribe. So the families become... Bigger families become tribes, and the 12 tribes become the nation of Israel. So that key tribe, Judah, is the lead tribe as they travel through the wilderness, making their way to the promised land. It's the royal tribe. The promise is that the the scepter will never leave the tribe of Judah. David is from the line of Judah, Jesus is from the line, the tribe of Judah. So when he's referred to as the lion of the tribe of Judah, or the lion of Judah, the lion was their insignia, their banner. All 12 tribes had a banner. Theirs was the lion. That was their their team mascot, if you will. So it talks about Judah became the sanctuary, Israel, that's the whole rest of the nation, and and it includes Judah, his dominion. The sea looked and fled. That's talking about the Red Sea. Jordan turned back. When they get to the promised land, uh, the Jordan River parts so they can cross into the promised land. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea? You flee. And then it repeats that. 
Verse 7, Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water and the flint into a spring of water. And so that's references to the two times that God miraculously provided water for them in the wilderness. So these are stories of praise and song that also teach and bring to remembrance to the Jewish people, their their heritage and what God has done for them. Psalm 115, to God be the glory, anonymous, psalm of praise. It's going to uh, contrast the mighty works of God with the futile, impotent idols. So it begins, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love. There, that word love, it just steadfast love or unfailing love in your translation or merciful kindness. From the Hebrew word, it just keeps popping up over and over and over in all, almost every chapter of a psalm. It says, that for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens, and he does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. They have noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. They have feet, but do not walk. And they cannot make a sound in their throat. I mean, when you put it like that, it sounds pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? That people were worshiping idols made by human hands that could do nothing. It says in verse 8, Those who make them become like them, nothing. And so do all that trust in them. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And And it goes on to talk about the house of Aaron. Moses' brother, trust in the Lord. He's their help and their shield. And so it repeats that phrase a few times. Verse 12, the Lord has remembered us and he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel and bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. And then it offers a blessing. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, and the earth he has given to the children of man. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go down in silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forward and forevermore. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Psalm 116, love the Lord for what he has done. Another anonymous psalm of thanksgiving. Um. This is a psalm psalm of personal thanksgiving, not just a corporate one. And it's um, important as uh, as we look at these halals to remember that Jesus would have been singing these the night of his Last Supper, arrest, betrayal. These would have been the songs they were singing. They were all, they were, uh, two of them were sung before the meal. Four of them were sung after the meal. So this one was sung after they had eaten. Um, Verse 1 says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. That phrase, I love the Lord, you know, I just mentioned how often steadfast love of God is mentioned. Uh, 129 times that word hesed in the Hebrew appears just in the Psalms. Do you know how many times it appears where it says, I love the Lord? Two. Sounds like a pretty one-sided love, doesn't it? I mean, we have, are receiving the steadfast, unmovable, unfailing, unchanging love of God and yet only twice does the psalmist say I love the Lord here and in Psalm 18 verse 1 that says I love you O Lord my strength we're a, and, and the word there is not hesed it's, it's human love which means it's 
not as stable, right? <laughs> it can fail. It's not always, it's, it's not as perfect as the love of God. Verse 2, he, because he inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol, the great, <clears throat> lay hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Three times that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, Father, if there is any other way, remove this cup, this cup of suffering from me. And yet he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he submitted to the will of his Father. But he did ask. Verse 4, then I called upon the name of the Lord. I just read that one, sorry. Verse 5, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. He preserves the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. You have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. And then verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We often hear this verse spoken at funerals. Um, and, and when many people think of saints, they think of, you know, the iconic people of the Bible or history. Uh, St. Luke, St. John. But in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, saints are what believers of faith in God are called. We're called saints. So it's very appropriate that this verse would be spoken at a funeral. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And you go, yeah, he's happy they died. Yeah, because then they get to come up and be relieved from whatever struggles they were experiencing in this world and in this life to life everlasting. And rejoicing takes place in heaven. Verse 16, O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the, the son of your handmaid. You've loosed my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 117, the praise of all peoples, another anonymous psalm of praise. This is the shortest psalm, two verses. It's the shortest chapter in the entire Bible. And I think it's pretty easy to understand. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. And so here, it's not just the nation of Israel that's told to praise God. It's even the Gentile nations. It's all the world. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. So that's pointing, you know, from the promise that God gave Abraham. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And from you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Jewish and Gentile. That was the promise to um, to Abraham. Verse 2, For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of God endures forever. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Psalm 118. This is the last one we're going to cover today, and this is the last of the Egyptian Hallel Psalms. And this is one that... Um, is really powerful as well as we're going to look at the life of Jesus as we look at this. Um, it doesn't give the name of the author, but there's reason to believe that it would have been King David, and we get that from the book of Ezra. Ezra 3, 9 and 10 suggests that Psalm 18 was what they 
sang as they laid the cornerstone to the second temple. The first temple had been destroyed by the Babylonians. The Jews were taken into captivity. Seventy years later, they come out and they begin rebuilding the temple. And Ezra records that, that this psalm, and it has some of the words of it in uh, Ezra, was written by David. So possibly it was David. It's called often David's psalm. It's also called Jesus' psalm, and you'll see why. This psalm is quoted 12 times in the New Testament, parts of it. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his steadfast love endures forever. So repetition in songs is nothing new, right? Make a point, just keep saying it, and sometime, sooner or later, it'll sink into these hard noggins. Right? Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as a helper. I will look in triumph on those who hate me. So hundreds of years before Romans was written, and Paul wrote, if God is for us, who can be against us? That was being also stated by the psalmist. Skip down to verse 14. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. So we see that right hand, right hand, right hand. That's another of those anthropomorphisms where it's a human quality spoken of by God uh, just to help us poor, puny-minded people understand better what God is doing. Um, it says, he goes on and says, um, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Or remember, this is, this is the last of the halals. This, Jesus would have been singing this with his disciples um, at, the, at their Passover meal. Verse 11, 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Now we have two very, very key verses you might want to underline them, put a star there, whatever. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Now, the cornerstone was the most important part of a building because from the cornerstone, the building went one way and another way and up. So it was important to get that laid properly and correctly because everything else is going to come off that, that first cornerstone. And so it's saying here, uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus quoted these two verses, 22 and 23, referring to his own rejection. So in the margin, if you want to write Matthew 21, 42 through 44, that's where he quotes it. It's also quoted by Peter in 1 Peter 2, 7. And then in uh, Peter's second great sermon, first great sermon, Acts 2, second great sermon, Acts 4, he said this, Acts 4, 11, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Pretty strong statement, huh? Not only is he the cornerstone, he's the only way to salvation, he's saying. 
Um, Charles Spurgeon talks about the cornerstone in this passage. He writes this. Now, he is the bond of the building, holding Jew and Gentile in firm unity. This precious cornerstone binds God and man together in wondrous amity. For he is both in one. He joins earth and heaven together, for he participates in each. He joins time and eternity together, for he was a man of few years, and yet he is the ancient of days. Wondrous cornerstone. What a good description of what Jesus is. Then in verse 24, this is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Yeah, another psalm, song from Psalms that we sing and are familiar with. And so we, you, we see how it works. You hear something over and over, you remember it. Right? And, you know, it's just like your kids ever said, Mom, you've told me that a thousand times. Yeah, well, you know what? God's told us some things over and over, too, because they're pretty important things to know, right? <laughs> Verse 25, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us. Do you know what the Hebrew word for that is? Hosanna. Do you know what they were saying on Palm Sunday as Jesus came down from the Mount of Olives, riding a donkey, fulfilling prophecy? They're waving the palm branches and saying, Hosanna. Hosanna to the king. And then they were saying, verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were singing this as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, so Matthew 21, 9 tells us that. Mark 11, 9 tells us that. John 12, 13, they all quote this phrase as being spoken by those who welcomed Jesus into uh, Jerusalem, acknowledging him as Messiah and King, celebrating him that Sunday, rejecting him, Denying him, yelling crucify him later that week. Powerful words. They were saying, save us, we pray. Do we say, save him? Save us, God, save us? And then later on, we're just like, yeah, I didn't really mean that. I don't really trust you. I don't believe you're the one. And we reject him. Or do we, when we say, Hosanna, save us, do we mean it? Because when we do, he comes into our lives. He gives us his Holy Spirit as a gift, a down payment. Paul calls it a deposit of our eternity right, right here in our hearts. Let's continue. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Verse 27. The Lord is God. And he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. Jesus became, was bound to the cross. That became the altar of his sacrifice. Verse 28. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. What a 
powerful set of psalms we've seen again today. It's amazing how with the psalms, we learn lessons going all the way back to Genesis that are tied in the middle of the psalms and then taken and, and we see the fulfillment of them in the New Testament and in, in the Gospels and in Hebrews, which is almost at the end of the Bible. So from beginning to end, this is not 66 separate books. Yeah, it's a library of 66 books, but there's one theme, and it's that God loves you forever. He loves you so much, He gave His only Son for you. He's been talking about Him since Genesis. And he's, uh, He was born in the Gospels, and He's returning when we get to the book of Revelation. God's Word is faithful and true. And he loves you more than any human could possibly love you. And has done more for you than anyone could possibly do for you. If you've not put your faith and trust in him, I pray that today will be the day that you invite him into your heart as your Lord and Savior and receive that gift of eternal life that he has for you. Oh, God, thank you for your love. We desire to love you greater and greater, but we have to admit that our love pales in comparison to yours. You have blessed us. We want to bless you, and all we can do is bless you really with words and, and actions of love. And so help us to be better at that. Guide us, oh, God as we serve you, as we study your word. Lord, put it into our minds. Help us to memorize some of it, to learn it. But God, we pray that it will not just stay in our heads. We want it to seep deep into our hearts so that we might truly believe it and receive it. Seep into our hands that we might touch lives that you lead us to that you might sink it into our feet so that we can carry the good news of the gospel throughout the world. Hosanna. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen.